back in the 1970s, there was a couple of professors from Harvard, I think, actually, they, I don't know if they were from Harvard, they published in Harvard Business Review, and they did a large study on the relationship between retention rates and product quality or customer satisfaction with that product. And the intuition is that, well, if we have high customer satisfaction, we will also have low churn, right? So there is some sort of relationship where good product, you know, people want it, so they stay, poor product, people don't really like it, so they leave. And that is true, but they also found out that the relationship between these two is actually nonlinear. And the model that came out of it is a model that I call the eye of Sauron, because it looks a little bit like an eye when I draw it up. So we have these two dimensions here, product quality and churn. So if we have really high churn, we are also expecting to have really low product quality. So we know that wherever we are, we're probably gonna start here, like that's the intuition, right? So high churn, low product quality. So, and then on the other end, you're gonna say, well, if we have really low churn, that's probably when we have a really, really outstanding good product, right? So we have these two ends here, where we're saying high quality, low churn, low quality, high churn, okay. So then we might say, is it just like this? And that was the question that the Howard professors asked in the article, they did all the research and they researched a lot of different sectors. They researched telco, automobiles, uh, cleaning services, a lot of different things. And they figured out that this is not the case, not true. They found out that the relationship between these two dots depends on the competition. So, First, they found out that businesses that are in a very low or even no competition environment can actually have a really, really poor product and still have very, very low churn rates. So the relationship looks like this here. Literally it plummets and then it travels here. So you can have a, like a really, really poor, let's say net promoter score or any other metric that you would measure customer satisfaction or quality by, and you still have really, really low churn rates if customers have nowhere else to go, right? So that sort of actually makes sense. And a lot of, let's say, blue ocean SaaS starts there. Like they find a solution, uh, or let's say they find a problem where there's no solution, so they go build the solution, they sell it to some customers, even though the customers don't really like the solution, like they think the product is like awkward or clunk here or not very mature or whatever it is, they stay because having the solution is better than not having the solution. So you're actually going to enjoy really, really low churn rates. So very high customer lifetime and very high customer lifetime value. Okay, that's great. And then the insight is, even though you might wanna improve the product from there, you actually don't materially affect your churn rate, right? So let's say that you have a 3% churn rate in your product annually, right? Very low. Should you then spend a lot of development resources to create an even better product and get it to 2%? Well, the insight is that you would have to spend a lot of development resources to really go from a, like let's say, good net promoter score to a absolute world-class one to even marginally affect your churn rate because it's already as low as it can go. And the relationship just provides very, very diminishing returns on the product dimension if you have no competition. What then happens if you have a lot of competition, if you're in a commoditized market and you're selling something that the customer can go out and get anywhere else? Well, the opposite happens. Now the customer travels along this line. Let's write commodity here. So this would be something like, let's say your average phone company, like Verizon, Vodafone and so forth. Like you can make calls and go online with their data services and send text messages, like on every one of them. So it isn't that improving their product from, let's say 50th percentile, like middle of the market to 75th percentile, like, oh, this has a good product, like the, the data roaming is even better or more stable, is materially gonna affect their churn because they have so much competition. So what happens here is that everybody has high churn and only the very, very best, like the 99th percentile companies will enjoy very low churn. So you can see here, again, you have this 
like this desert, the product desert, where I would, if I'm, if I'm anywhere here, I would have to spend spend a lot, a lot, a lot of value to get to the very, very end, in order to get even marginal returns on my on my churn rate. Where you say, okay, at the very end, it starts to actually drop. Like for the top five, ten percent of providers, it starts to drop off. But until then, I get no benefit from investing in product. So I need to know as a provider, if I'm in a commoditized market, do I have the team, do I have the skills, do I have the budget and resources and patience to walk this line to actually improve my churn rate? Or should I spend my efforts elsewhere? Like, can I just sell more? Or can I like shift somewhere else or whatever it is? And that is actually where it starts to become interesting because this is where we now draw the eye. This is what I think looks like an eye, right? So you have the the pupil here and then you have the, the whole eye here. And you, because you have another couple of scenarios here, you have high competition and then you just have low competition. So it's not no competition, it's just there is competitors, it's just low. And then you have like more than low, so you have relatively high competition, but it isn't like, you know, you're tripping over competitors everywhere you go. So it's like, okay, so customers can actually get a couple of offers and they will somebody will call them and try to steal them from you. Your churn moves down fast with just a, let's say, marginal or small increase in product quality, where on the other end down here, you have the inverse, right? You'll say, I need to do a lot of product quality, that's the horizontal axis, and actually I don't get a lot of churn. So it's just one of the things where you can say, well, if you know what kind of market you're in and you can see, well, am I in high competition or low competition? So in low competition, the, the rule of thumb would be, if you have a really poor product, invest in it. But if you have a medium product, don't, right? If you have a high competition um, scenario, you might even say, if I have a really, really shitty product, well, if I can survive there, actually, I, I will have to know that at the beginning, I will get very, very poor returns on my product quality. But if I can get to the high end of the market and be one of the product leaders here, then I can enjoy really, really good or low churn rates here. So it just gives you a perspective of what kind of investment in product you need to make to really materially affect churn. And that depends on, well, what level of competition you have. Now, so this is one way to solve it. This is to solve it with product quality or product development. And that can be hard and it can take a lot of time. Like usually traveling from here to here on a product dimension can take years, right? So if you don't have years and you are facing really high churn rates, then what you can do is you can just jump the lines. And the way that you usually jump lines is that you change your market. Like you change to selling it to someone where the competition is just less. And you can do that, for example, by niching down. So these are essentially the two kinds of choices you have when you're understanding the relationship between product quality and churn. I use it a lot to just create an option space, like what could we do? What is the right course of action? What would it take? What would it take to move product? What would it take to niche down? And what kind of scenario or outcome can we expect to get if we do so? I hope it makes sense to you and I hope that you find it useful too. Maybe you'll understand like why something is working the way that it works uh, for you today. And maybe you have some ideas of what you can do about it after looking at this. So the Iron Sauron for churn and product quality in SaaS. Thank you.